Hi everyone, welcome back to the workshop and it's part two of the model 7128 GTEC EEPROM programmer. In the first video I went ahead and tore the programmer down and we had a look at the circuit board, we had a look at the, the schematic that I drew up, I reverse engineered various parts of the circuit just to work out how the actual programmer was working. Well, at the end of that video I started removing the transformer which I've got here, the 115 volt transformer in order that I could fit a 240 volt one for the UK. So I've actually gone ahead and done that. It's uh, Here it is here and it's slightly bigger than the original transformer but I did manage to shoehorn it in. I drilled an extra hole on the panel there just to uh, get it fitted and I've gone ahead and wired it up there. I've crimped all the connections. I didn't use these uh, screw on things here. I don't know what you call them but I just think they're already inherently dangerous these things. Anyway it's all crimped up. I've got the original fuse in place and uh, I have powered it up and it is actually working. So in this video I want to see if it actually works. I've uh, made up a cable for the serial interface in order to connect it to a PC and we're going to actually see if we can program some blank EEPROMs and uh, see if we can get up and running. So let me go and reposition the camera and we'll take a look at my test setup. So yes, you are looking at a very old laptop and the reason for that is the original software is designed to run on DOS and no matter how I tried, I couldn't get it to work with Windows 10. Windows 10 being 64-bit and this program designing to run on DOS it was always going to be pretty hard to do. I did actually try uh, installing some virtual DOS um, programs on Windows 10. I tried a couple of different ones but they just wouldn't work with the serial port properly. So I managed to find my old uh, Windows XP laptop and uh, powered it up and I think it is actually working with the GTEC. What you're looking at there is a DOS box. I've got the, the command prompt running there just waiting to start running the program. I made up a serial cable as well. The other end's plugged into the back of the COM1 port on the back of the laptop and this end here straight from the manual, the wiring diagram in the manual is ready to be plugged into the programmer and powered up. So let me go ahead and do that now. So the first thing I'll do is power on the 7128 and plug in the serial cable. Now let's have a look at the laptop. Right, we're ready to start the program and to do that it's PGX12. I think the 1 is specifying COM1 uh, which is the only COM port on the back of this laptop so let's hit return and you can see program interface package version 5.04 that's what I was getting in Win 10 but looks like I'm getting much further on uh, this uh, MS-DOS on this uh, WinXP laptop, great. So we've got a GTEC incorporated model 7128 version 3.26 copyright 1982 and we've got a flashing command prompt there with four X's in it. So the four X's signify what EEPROM type you have selected and the first thing you do when you run the program is specify that. And to do that we use the M command, so just M on the keyboard, press return and now we've got an EEPROM selection menu coming up. I've got a bunch of 2716 EEPROMs off camera, so that's B for 2716, so we'll just hit B and immediately you can see that the four X's have changed to 2716. We're now configured for 2716 type EEPROM. So here we go, I've got the EEPROM installed. Now one thing I've learnt looking through the manual, uh, I'm using the command prompt to interface with the GTEC 7128 but I think you're actually supposed to use a terminal window and the reason for that is I don't see any way of actually reading an EEPROM and dumping it to file from the command prompt. By using a proper terminal program you would be able to capture the contents of the data coming back into the terminal program in order to save it to file. Now to read is the R command 
and then you specify a start and an end address. So we'll go for a zero comma and we'll just take the first 255 bytes. So I'll specify FF and hex. And if I press return, you can see that it's reading the EEPROM and it's coming back all Fs. The reason for that is it's a blank EEPROM and all blank EEPROMs by default are filled with FF, not 00, zero as you might think. So, so far, so good. Now, there are a couple of different ways of reading back the EEPROM back to the laptop. I just used the R command for read, but you, there is actually a list command. And we'll try that now. So, it's L for list. And we'll try the same again. 0, comma, FF. And we'll hit return. And you can see it's list in the hex at this side here and if there were the correspondent ASCII on the right hand side. And of course it's all FF so you're not seeing very much ASCII there. And another method for reading back is uh, reading back in a format of your own choice. So let's see if we can list an Intel hex format. So that's OI for that. And we'll try 0 comma FF again. And there's an Intel hex format. Now again, if I had a terminal program, of course, I could be reading that directly back into the terminal and dumping it to file from there. Now, because we're not using a terminal program, um, I can't actually send files to the 7128, but I can program individual bytes on the EEPROM or a small range of bytes on the EEPROM manually. And to do that, you use the P command. So let's say we want to program location 444 with 33 hex And the following location, which would be 445, with 23 hex. That's what you would type in there. And you need to send uh, an end of program instruction, which is a dollar sign. So let's put in the dollar at the end there. And it looks like it's done it. So let's try reading back location 444 and 445 and see what we've got. So let's try listing 0, 800 and see what we get. So here's it listing it back. I did actually play around and I managed to program address 0 with C9 and address 1 with A1, but we'll ignore that. We're looking for 444 on the address down the left hand side here. So we'll let it scroll up until it gets there. And here we go. I'll send the dollar sign to abort that and you can see 4401234 and 445 33 and 23. <laughs> it worked. Now I know you never saw it uh, when we were looking at the laptop but whenever there's an action going on on the command prompt the busy light on the uh, programmer does come on so every time we're doing a read or a program the busy light just com comes on uh, permanently until the command's completely finished. So let me power off the programmer. I've got something extra. Remove the EEPROM, remove the serial cable and we'll switch off power. So I was actually contacted by uh, a viewer in the previous video who goes by the name of Dave who has quite an interest in this series of microprocessors and uh, asked me if I could copy out the program from the EEPROM on the back of the board here and send it to him and he was going to try disassembling it. So I did actually go ahead that, I popped out the EEPROM, stuck it into my Dataman S4 programmer and sent him the hex file that I got. And he came back to me and says it's garbage. It's just a load of rubbish that's uh, in the file. So it required a little bit of extra um, examination 
on the actual circuit. So what I did was I did a little bit more of reverse engineering and what you see here is a table of the EEPROM connections and how that actually maps to the actual CPU itself. We've got the pins down here on the CPU and we've got the uh, port against each one of those pins down the right hand side. Now because we got rubbish coming out uh, from the EEPROM via my datum and S4 kind of gave us a little bit of a clue that perhaps the data bus connections uh, between the CPU and the EEPROM were not mapped one to one. In other words, uh, bit zero of a particular port on the CPU is not necessarily mapped to bit zero on uh, the data bus on the actual EEPROM and that turned out to be the case. If you take a look here we've got the, the data bus first of all we've got D0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 in a, quite an, a, a logical order down there uh, on the EEPROM. You map that across to the pins in the CPU you'll find that D0 is mapped to DB5, D1 is mapped to DB6 D2 is mapped to DB7 and then D3 is mapped to DB0 so on and not much wonder we was getting garbage coming back reading the EEPROM. On top of that looking at the address bus we've got the same thing happening there. If you look at the address bus we've got zero, we've got A0, A1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and down here 8, 9, 10 and 11 there and the same thing happens if you map across A0 to the CPU is DB4 then 2 then 7 6 0 5 <laughs> just no logical order whatsoever. Now it doesn't really matter that you don't have it, the data bus or the address bus mapped properly against the corresponding pins in the CPU because at the end of the day the address bus is just a location in memory and physically within the actual uh, EEPROM itself. It doesn't really matter if, e if the, the first byte in the EEPROM is stored in the normal place or elsewhere within the EEPROM. As long as the EEPROM is programmed accordingly to take that into consideration, which it obviously was because as far as the CPU is concerned when it reads address 0 and looks for a particular byte on D0 through to D7 it's going to get that because the data is uh, going to be compensated for within the EEPROM. So what Dave was interested in doing was disassembling it so it wasn't until I managed to send this over to Dave he was able to work out what was being switched in terms of the address bus and also the data bus compensate for that from that point onwards he was able to disassemble the program properly. So you might ask why mix up the address bus and why mix up the data bus? Well there's a couple of reasons for that. And number one is just to make it easier to run the traces on the board to interface the EEPROM to the actual microprocessor. So if you was to try and do it properly so that there was no mixing up it might require a lot more traces, a lot more vias on the board uh, in order to do that. So by switching it around you might just use the most logical pins in terms of the traces on the board. The second reason is to make it harder for somebody to remove the EEPROM from the programmer and do what we've just done and that is to disassemble the program and find out how it works. So let's take a look. So I've opened up the disassembled file on my computer here and looking down at here's just some header information that Dave's put on that. Uh, size is 4096. Uh, the checksum, the date, etc. The CPU used, it's an MCS48 family and just some I.O. information here from the ports and you can see that P24 and P25 was the VPP select I think which I managed to work out uh, when I uh, uh, reverse engineered the schematic. 
and uh, here is the actual program itself. Uh, the formatting is a little bit off in uh, the uh, my notepad plus plus but if we can ignore that down the left hand side you've got the address and the next couple of columns are the actual hex stored in those addresses and over at the right the actual program itself in assembly language all the move commands etc uh, etc et now if we do a search for vpp I can see it's taken us down to uh, a location within the actual program and you can see that Dave's actually started commenting on uh, some of the I.O. instructions there uh, set P25 high VPP switching, uh, P25 low etc etc no, It doesn't mean much to me really, I'm not really an assembly uh, programmer uh, much more at home with like say uh, VB or C++ something like this so this is just gobbledygook to me but it's very interesting all the same uh, you come down here you can actually see strings of data here this is the uh, EEPROM selection that we saw earlier on on the, the laptop there uh, where you can actually select the uh, type of EEPROM so here's all where that data is stored yep all very interesting. So it only really remains for me to, to box this thing back up so we'll go ahead and do that now. Here's the original enclosure and uh, hopefully it should all fit in uh, even though the transformer is a little bit bigger than it was before. Yep. Now what I'm actually going to do with this, uh, I don't know, I'm going to keep it. It's uh, an old school programmer. It's uh, might make for an interesting project in the future I mean because it uses a serial interface so it's not out with bounds of possibilities that I could actually connect this to an Arduino to program it or better still write my own Windows 10 program and perhaps use a serial to USB uh, interface and write my own front end for the programmer use it in the future for programming EEPROMs we'll just have to wait and see Thanks for watching.